Hello. So in this lab, in this uh, video, rather, um, I'm going to be talking about the next lab, which is on mass spring damper system dynamics. This lab is going to involve using a beam mass system. Um, we're also going to introduce accelerometers. I'll have that short discussion in a separate video. I'm going to try in this video with the discussion of the lecture to integrate the pre-lab discussion. So what I've done is within these set of slides, sort of dispersed pre-lab questions. So there's about 30 slides. I'm hoping um, I can keep this uh, within a reasonable time. But since I will have the pre-lab there, I'll kind of move quickly through some of the slides, let you go back and read them, pause, and uh, spend a little bit more time on the pre-lab to help you prepare for, for this coming lab. So the purpose of this lab is to uh, help you build on and strengthen the understanding of, of a topic that is probably familiar from a physics course. Um, but it's helpful really to use this basic model to understand the type of response analysis that, that, that we do for these uh, second order systems, which is what it turns out to be, because they uh, end up being very helpful in understanding the you know analogous systems that you have in other energy domains. As we go through it, keep that in mind. The better you understand uh, second order system dynamics you know, for this very basic system, which is very easy to uh, build insight into, you can hopefully use that to help you understand how similar kinds of dynamic effects occur in other kinds of systems. Also, the, uh, the, the model and the system response, these methods are very helpful in, in design and also for understanding what you want systems to do. In other words, what kind of specifications you might um, require when you have basically mass, stiffness, and damping all playing a key role in, in um, a, a basic system. So methods and ideas that we'll talk about should be helpful there. And something I also like to talk about is understanding the response analysis is helpful when you're trying to design experiments. Also, it's very helpful to use these models to design physical experiments, especially for second order systems. And those experiments can be used to extract um, parameters that you can't get from simple static experiments. Usually something like damping, as we'll see, you need to design a dynamic experiment in order to extract that parameter value and, and I'll talk about that in this in this lecture. Okay, and as I said, we're, we're going to be using a simple configuration, the, the, the beam that we've used in the previous lab with a, a mass attached at the end and that forms a very simple mass spring damper system, very easy to control and, and to use for our purposes. So the mass spring damper model again, um, and I'm kind of separ like to separate it into two different configurations. The one that you're very familiar with is the fixed base configuration where the spring and the damper are mechanically in parallel. What I mean by that is is they have the same velocity, right? They 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 are going to be compressed and extended at, at the same velocity. And the and the mass is is connected to both of them. I'm going to be primarily talking about linear systems. So I've put the linear constitutive relations for each of the elements shown here. And whenever you see parameters like k or b here, it usually is conveying that the assumption should be made that those elements, for the purposes of that model, um, represent uh, can be represented in a model by, by linear constitutive laws. So, you know, the damper, for example, has a force on it that uh, is uh, induced by this velocity, which is the rate of change of the ends. I mean, how you fast you pull it or, or compress it times some constant, this, this damping coefficient. Um, and um, compare that configuration, fixed base, to a basic side of configuration. And this one, can you have the mass, sorry, the spring and damper in parallel, but unlike this one where when you might have a force applied on the mass directly. In the basic side of configuration, what you're exciting, what the, the forcing for this system is the base. And, and I'm showing here the rate of change of, of that position y. So y dot is a velocity. So 
the base excitation is a, is a velocity input for the basic side of configuration and for the fixed base configuration you have a forcing input here. It doesn't make sense to put a velocity in here. I mean you could have that but but then you don't have a need for any kind of dynamic equation. If you put a velocity in here you know the velocity of that mass and there's no there's nothing unknown about the motion of that mass, right? It's only when you causally put a force on here that oh if I need to know the motion of that mass I need to solve a differential equation, right? So uh, in this case you have a base velocity as an input and you don't know what the motion of that mass is. And these two very basic configurations again are used to build up more complex systems but even at, at this in, in this simple form you see you see that they pop up in a lot of practical applications and so I wanted to just talk about a couple of those. Again they, these models can be used to study many practical problems on the fixed base many many mechanical structures buildings etc take this form obviously uh, you, you could have something and, and by the way when you when I'm showing you mass spring damper this could be um, as we'll study it it could be in bending as well so you could have translation for the bending beam or the, the rotational model as well could 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 be here you could, instead of having um, a mass a translational mass you could have rotational mass all of this again will hold for that as well um, and you know, you, for a more complex building, you might stack many of these together. Understanding the dynamics of a, a simple, what we call single degree of freedom system, mass spring damper system, really gives you the insight to understand more complex applications of this model to represent more complex systems, buildings, other more complex structures, and so on. Similarly, the uh, the basic side of configuration is used in a lot of practical applications. It's a model for uh, suspension of different types, and it's also the way you model seismic sensors, either you know seismometers for measuring you know motion of the ground, say, or accelerometers. Uh, and in that case, you know what the what this model represents is the actual sensor device. It's a dynamic type of device, and uh, and the, and this motion input is what that sensor is picking up. So again, think about how these are really an analog. These models have analogies in, in all the energy domains, not just in mechanical translation and rotation, but also in hydraulics and uh, electrical circuits, obviously, and so on. So, what you pick up here is going to be translated into other other applications. As I mentioned, forcing in each case, you have force versus velocity, and keep those in mind. And these problems. Um, when we start looking at them, and I, I, I believe you should be looking at this in your related dynamic systems class. But you know, you study the response of these systems both when you have unforced conditions. In other words, those forces may be zero. In other words, you don't have an input force, or you don't have ground motion, which then it defaults to the simple fixed base case. But um, when we talk about unforced response, what we're talking about is looking at the transient response, say, to an initial condition. So in the case of a mass, you might be you know, compressing the spring and then releasing, and, 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 and the system vibrates. So you look at that transient effect until it might come to a rest condition. And that's how we'll be studying, uh, for example, that beam mass system in the lab. The other case is the forced response becomes a little bit more complicated. Now you have either input force or input velocity and you may be interested in what happens right when you turn on that forcing so um, if you have a step input obviously that's a transient type input force and you want to see what happens as the system responds you have impulses but also we sometimes talk about steady response or what happens after the transient dies out and if you have some force like a harmonic input you know some kind of of steady vibration or even a random type input from from the environment, from wind, etc. Um, we are interested in what's hap what's happening as as the system responds over time, and so you should, you know, in again in dynamic systems class, be studying uh, the response characteristics for these systems for both unforced and forced response, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about those. And so I'm going to show you a few examples here. Um, so here's a typical 
um, you know, fan might be sitting on a base and this is compliant and uh, let's say it's got stiffness both um, vertically and maybe also laterally but let's say laterally it's very stiff so you might model this like a simple mass spring damper system now what's causing this to vibrate might be that you this uh, impeller has a little bit of eccentric mass so when it rotates right I should kind of show that here in the schematic as that mass has some eccentricity it's gonna it's gonna cause a dynamic force to be applied at the shaft of that impeller and it really is going to be an XY or vertical and lateral force but if this thing this uh, mass is constrained in the vertical direction then we really only care about the, the component of that force in the vertical direction so that's how you'd model that input force it's being induced by that eccentric load so at the end of the day you've got a nice simple application of a mass spring damper system to to uh, a system like this and what you might be doing is trying to find out what stiffness should I use I, I, I put some damping here because there could be some material damping or you might be trying to figure out how do I damp the vibration of this thing so it doesn't um, uh, vibrate so much so selection of those parameters is, is a little bit of a design problem Here's an example of the of the basic sided system. As I mentioned, the seismic sensor and the seismic sensor kind of already looked at this, but you have a case that surrounds that seismic mass. This this figure shows the stiffness and and damping between the mass and the case. So the case is what's moving here, right? And those that or this stiffness element and this damping element are still in parallel and they're suspending that mass in between and so this is um, a model for an accelerometer for example a seismic sensor in this case again this motion input um, is is what this device is trying to basically detect and um, I'll talk about that in a separate lecture as I said find another application of that basic sided configuration is any kind of um, vehicle suspension and this just shows a single mass suspended say by a stiffness and damper that might represent say the um, a, t a tire stiffness and damping and uh, the contact uh, with the road you can see is, is, is going to be moving up and up and down based on the profile of that road let's say that's a rigid road so this contact point represents an ideally where that say a tire might contact the road this represents tire stiffness and damping and then this might represent axle mass I'm not showing uh, and this also represents for example a quarter of, the, of, of a vehicle if you like and I'm also not showing the, the, the rest of the suspension just to keep this simple um, but as you can see this is the way you model this is this this mass is moving across the surface in the x direction now x is in this in the lateral direction and what we're interested in is in the vibration of this mass in the vertical or in the z direction here and what we would need to know is how to model this motion and this talks a little bit about that I'm not going to go into great detail here but basically by knowing the profile of this road how fast you're moving you can come up with a, an expression for the velocity in the z direction at that uh, input point and then you've got a nice application of that basic sided model okay so you can see that really simple configurations can be used in a lot of different ways so now let's focus a little bit on the fixed base mass spring damper system this is the system that we're going to study in the lab and um, again here's the figure I'm not going to go into great detail into the model but you know you've seen this model plenty of times the basic approach is you you know you had you isolate the mass, build a free body diagram, and um, apply Newton's law. So Newton's law says the rate of change of momentum, which is mx double dot, is the sum of the net forces on here, which is the damper uh, force, the spring force, and then any external load uh, force, sorry, f of t. So those three forces, um, you get the second order ODE here. There's a lot of assumptions that are made here, for example, that this velocity VB for this damper force is equal to X dot, right? Because one side of that damper is fixed. So these are things that you hopefully are picking up in your, uh, in your systems class on how to model systems like this, but that model falls out. 
and at the end of the day you get this very familiar second order linear ODE because we had all linear constitutive relations so linear because all of the derivatives and states all the right the, the state and the state derivatives are all linear you have linear um, I'm sorry constant coefficients uh, so a, a nice uh, linear second order ODE to be solved what we do is put um, and we'll see the value of doing this is put this into a standard form when you do that you know, you can, in this case, you um, divide through by the coefficient of your second order derivative term, and and so you have no coefficient here, and that allows you to define the a coefficient in front of the first order derivative as this two zeta omega n, right? And then you have omega n squared on the uh, on the x term here. U is just the uh, f uh, over m, right? Remember, you have to have unit consistency here, and you do this as an acceleration. Uh, U is f over m is an acceleration. The units are all consistent. And omega n is the undamped natural frequency. Zeta is the damping ratio. We're going to be talking quite a bit about those. Also identify here that t sub n, I'm going to call the undamped natural period, which is just 2 pi over omega n. This has units of seconds, right? That's the period of oscillation, say, uh, in the undamped natural period. So let's look at one special case and then we'll look at some of the others. And the first case that we'll look at is, is when we don't have any damping. And again, this is a very uh, ideal case. Um, it's very rare not to have any damping in a system, but it's a useful approximation in some cases. So as you can see, I've taken out the damping here, so I've just got a mass spring system. Very nice. The solution you can show, and I'm not going to drive them here, but you can, you can see that if I don't have any forcing, all I have is some initial conditions. So I might, you know, might push the mass down and release it from rest. So I'm defining two initial conditions, right? What is the initial displacement? What is the initial velocity? Since I released it from rest, the initial velocity was zero. So I've defined both of those initial conditions, which um, show up here in the solution. As you can see, the, the solution x depends only on the initial conditions and on the natural frequency. So it's kind of nice because once you know those values, then you know everything you need to know about the system. This system oscillates forever, right? And uh, you you uh, when people talk about oscillators or linear oscillators, this is the basic equation they're talking about. So you can apply this in a lot of different ways. For example, the pendulum that we looked at before, right? This was x was theta. We had theta double dot plus some term times theta for a linear small motion of the compound pendulum. So we knew that omega n squared here was related to like length, gravity, and mass, and so on. Uh, in this case, this natural frequency is k over m, right? So the natural frequency, uh, once you know the stiffness and, and mass, then you can find natural frequency. Or if you know natural frequency, you know stiffness, you can find mass, and so on. So understanding the interplay between these relationships is what I'm trying to say is very helpful whenever you're trying to find one thing given that you don't, you know the other two, and so on. So again, simple experiment. Mass could be released from some initial value at rest. Let it go. It's just going to oscillate forever with a period determined by the undamped natural period, right? Real simple solution. This is the case where in x dot is zero, but you give it an initial condition. Nice thing about this configuration here, or sorry, or this this little experiment, is uh, you know you can use it to um, to do to test the system, right? You can perturb the system this way, and and um, from the way it responds, if you're measuring things, you can determine you know certain characteristics from that from the system. Once you have x, you can find velocity, acceleration, and so on. So you can see that. Um, just uh, just given that the, the those two values, so it's kind of nice that way. Um, just want to show you a really quick solution and that that um, what you can do with with the kinds of uh, response relations that you get for this uh, ideal case. Just about this point, um, you might be asking, well, why haven't I put gravity in there? And it turns out that when you have, I'm not going to read through all this. You can go back and read this later. But when you have a linear system like vibrational system it turns out that the you know gravity if it does play a role 
really only is going to tell you something about where the system is going to sit, right? So it, it gives you the equilibrium position, and then the motion about that equilibrium is going to be the same uh, as the response relations that we're going to find here, as long as you don't overrange it and so on. Then the system, then the problem becomes nonlinear. So once you start getting nonlinear effects, either because the spring's not linear. You know, if it's if it's not a simple f equals kx, or the damper is not linear, then then it really gets difficult to do the analysis in a simple way using the models that we're going to talk about. But for a lot of practical applications, you can make these approximations, and and um, you get really nice kind of back of the envelope calculations using these results. Um, again, if you have like a nonlinear spring, then you 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 do have to linearize the system or think about it in a different way. Okay, so in those cases, gravity is important because it's going to tell you where systems sit, and then you need to find out where you know what kind of stiffness you have in those points and so on. That's a little bit out of the scope of what we want to talk about, but um, because most people start wondering where where is gravity in these models, I wanted to say something about that. So now let's move on to the cases where we we have some damping, which are the most practical cases, and you might remember this. You know, once we have uh, a b not zero, then um, we, for the second order system, linear case, we usually start categorizing our responses based on the parameter zeta, and you remember how that was defined. When you put the this, this system model in this standard form, and that's why it's worth doing this, you can identify what zeta is in terms of the system parameters and calculate it. If you find that zeta is less than 1, your response is going to be underdamped. If it's greater than one, overdamped, and equal to one, critically damped. Each case has a different response solution, right? And I'll put some handouts in your textbook. Many different references out there will show you how to solve for for uh, for these or give you the response solutions. I'm just going to show you one case here. And that's for the underdamped case. So in the underdamped case, if if um, if you solve for that, and here's the general formula, right? It's a solution for that system. And note how x here depends on just the initial conditions, right? And and again, this is this is the unforced response, right? I don't, I'm, I'm not, I'm not talking about forced response uh, yet. So the unforced response, I should make that. You should be really clear here. Um, the solution for the unforced response x. Um, is a function of you know zeta and omega and papa. You have this exponential times uh, these big brackets here. In each of these terms, you have a sine cosine term. The coefficients in front of that are all just dependent on the initial conditions of the initial velocity of the mass, the initial position of the mass. And then what pops up is a new term, omega d, which we'll call the damped natural frequency. And note how it's related to the undamped natural frequency, and that's very important because the damped natural frequency and, and the damped period, which is related to the damped natural frequency, those are the quantities that we can actually measure because most systems are damped. So if we're going to go into the lab and measure, say, the oscillation frequency of a system, this period is what we're measuring. I want you to keep that in mind. And we'll talk about that in a second. So again, just like for the undamped solution, once I have this x, if I want to find velocity acceleration, just differentiate these very easily, and I have those response solutions. Uh, actually, this case holds like only for zeta less than 1 or greater than, or actually is equal to 0. If you make zeta equal to 0 in this equation, you it defaults to the undamped case. And as you can see, there's a created a little bi where I just put in that formula, and you can see for different values of initial conditions and velocity and position, um, and for different values of zeta and omega n, you can play around with this. Um, most books also have plots like this, but I'll give you this little vi so you can play with it if you like. I'm not going to bring it up just in the interest of time. Okay, so first pre-lab that I want you to submit is uh, for, for a mass spring damper system that has certain values of mass, stiffness, and damping b. Calculate the natural frequency, calculate the damping ratio, zeta, and, and confirm that this system is underdamped. It should be, right? So this is really just about you practicing with those equations. And calculate the damped natural frequency 
and explain the difference, know how to explain the difference between damp natural frequency and undamped natural frequency. Just simple calculation here. Okay, so those are just applications of those formulas. All right, so that's, let's talk a little bit about the problem that we're going to be looking at in, 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 in the lab. This is basically the configuration that we have. We have a beam, kind of like the strain gauge beam that we used in the previous lab, and we're just going to attach a mass here. And um, now that I show that you can this effectively model this just like that fixed base configuration. Now, you know, this is this is vibrating. The tip location is vibrating up and down. This in small motion it approximates the system, right? Um, we know that the stiffness is approximately three times of Young's modulus area moment inertia over L cubed. So we can approximate K pretty well. But you can also measure this. Uh, get a good measure of K, and and that's probably a little bit, at least using static experiments, putting loads, measuring the deflection, you can get the stiffness too if you don't have these physical properties, and that's something that we did in the previous lab. So we're going to assume that we don't have any force on here when we study this in the lab. Also, there is damping here because there's going to be damping introduced because most beams won't vibrate forever. They're going to have some internal losses, so there's damping that arises material damping as well as you know this vibrates fast enough the the um, friction from from wind does does slow it down a little bit also we don't and those are very difficult quantities to get a hold of it's very difficult to estimate damping theoretically in these cases so when you're modeling this say you took a beam in the lab mounted a mass at the tip um, deflect it a known amount and release it. Now, how well do you think you could pre predict the, the three quantities, displacement, velocity, and acceleration, given the model we just presented? And um, let's say I asked you specifically to predict you know, how many oscillations before um, it comes to a stop. You know, what are the peak values of each oscillation? I say that's an important characteristic. Maybe you're trying to estimate, let's say this is a system that gets perturbed, released, perturbed, released many, many times, and you want to estimate, um, say, the, the life of, of that part. So you're going to want to know how many cycles you might have to failure, what the level is, so you want to know how many exceed a certain strain level, and so on. So you can, you, you should, you can probably begin thinking about where this could have nice practical application. So what would you need to know for this system? And, and, and we know that from the response equation that we just discussed, if you can nail down the natural frequency and the damping ratio, and if you know what those initial deflections are, uh, you can estimate all of these quantities pretty well, right? I also wanted to pose this in, in a different case, in a different light, like uh, as a design problem. So let's say I wanted you to explore in a design space and you know, select, you know, size the beam, you know, attach a certain amount of mass, you want this to, to respond in a certain way, and you'd need to understand something about, uh, and let's say you wanted it to meet certain, now you're kind of going backwards, you know how many oscillations you want it to have, you know how, what those peak values should be, now you need to choose values that satisfy that specification. The problem is, you know, you really don't have a model for the damping, in the system, so you can't estimate zeta. Um, and even for the known mass um, attached to the beam, let's say you knew what you were going to attach, I bring up now that the beam also has some mass, and um, and you don't know, can, can that be ignored um, if you want to estimate the natural frequency? In other words, is the beam an ideal spring where it has no mass effect. So you'd also need to know the initial condition, but you can measure that. So uh, that, that isn't as difficult. You need to know it within some precision. So it's clear that even for such a simple system, you you know, you do need to go in and make some measurements if you're trying to, to nail down you know, some of these parameters. So here's a typical laboratory ob objective. You know, attach. You know, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna be introducing an accelerometer, so I want to ask you to attach the accelerometer on that beam and any other additional mass. So the lump mass that you might attach to this beam is going to be 
the mass of the accelerometer plus any additional mass that, that you might put on there or the TA might put on there for you. And you're going to form a beam mass system. And I'm going to want you to find natural frequency, damping ratio, and, and also the total effective mass of the beam system. And, and I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Right? The total effective mass is going to be the sum of any mass that you attach, you know, the lump mass, which is the accelerometer mass, and some fraction, sorry, the attached mass, the accelerometer mass, and some unknown fraction of the beam mass. Now, I'm going to show you why in a second, why that, why that comes up, okay? So first, before you go into the lab, you could sit down and given what you know, you could, you could, you know, back of the envelope calculation estimate what's the highest natural frequency I could have and what's, and, I, and very specific, undamped natural frequency you can have and what's the lowest value you can have. And the way you can do that is take two cases. Assume that the beam is massless, that there's no mass from the beam that's contributing to your natural frequency, and that's simple. Then you just take the stiffness of the beam, K over B, divided by the attached mass, okay? And that gives you one value. Since that's the, uh, the lowest mass you have, that's going to be the highest natural frequency. So you can create these limits or these bounds on the actual natural frequency. The other one is just say, hey, all of the mass of the beam, M sub B, is going to contribute to the total mass for this this lumped approximation, right? So so your natural frequency, your lowest value, is going to be the stiffness of the beam divided by that total mass. So now you've got sort of what you could say is, is uh, the limits on this natural frequency. Now you at least have upper and lower values. You could stop there and you could give all of your answers in terms of upper and lower values and you wouldn't have to try to get it exactly on the money. How wide that those limits are would determine on whether, how valuable they are. If they're so broad, the possibility is so broad, then then, um, then they, it might not be very useful. But if it's just a very narrow band, then it might be good enough just to give those that range of values. Right? The actual value is going to lie somewhere in between, and it's going to be some fraction of that mass. Right? It's not going to be the whole thing, and it's not going to be zero. So we're going to try to figure that out. I want to show you one theoretical result that tries to nail down that value. And that's um, a little result that's reported um, in an appendix by Den Hartog. And this is very common analysis that's done to approximate, you know, for this kind of beam configuration. You have, you have a beam with some mass. I know the notation is different in this excerpt. And I'm, I'm posting this appendix from Den Hartog uh, on the course log so you can look at all the other configurations he has. But the lump mass at the end is big M. Little m here represents the beam mass, and and note he says if you have a cantilever with an n mass m and the beam mass, you know, little m, you can approximate this undamped natural frequency by taking k over the total attached mass and take about 0.23 times uh, little, the beam mass, and that will give you a pretty good approximation of the undamped natural frequency of that system. So he uses a fractional beam mass, it's 0.23 m in this formula. And where does that come from? Well, it comes from a theoretical analysis referred to as you know, Rayleigh's method. Um, and I'm also putting a little handout for those of you interested on the course log if you want to see how that's derived. There's also another separate derivation for the specific beam mass case to show you how Rayleigh's method is used for the beam mass case if you're interested. But let's just let's use this as a theoretical value. Um, remember this is not the actual value, but it's a theoretical value and if we find that we can measure a value that's pretty close to this, then this gives us some confidence in this theoretical estimate, and we could use that for, for design applications, for example. So we want to test that method, or rather the results from that, from that method. So here's your pre-lab two. Apply those formulas. You have two cases here I want you to look at. So before you run any experiments, do this before you go to lab. You can calculate expected values using the methods that we just described. So for this pre-lab problem, I want you to submit answers to both of these. The first one is, you know, you should have all the parameters for your, your aluminum cantilever beam or set up a quick little spreadsheet that you can make those calculations quickly. I want you to assume that you have some attached mass and the accelerometer mass is about 46 grams. 
and you put that at the tip, you should know what that distance is depending on where you define the tip of your beam. And I want you to calculate those upper and lower limits on your undamped natural frequency for, for your beam configuration, right? Report the natural undamped natural frequencies in units of radians per second as well as in hertz. And the relationship is, and this should be omega sub n here, the natural frequency in radians per second is 2 pi times the natural frequency, undamped natural frequency in hertz. So f sub n here is the undamped natural frequency in, in, in hertz cycles per second versus radians per second. I want you to see the difference between those two, right? Um, so that's the first case, use those upper and lower bounds. Second one is go ahead and calculate the uh, estimate using that hard talk relation where you say, hey, I've got a beam mass. I want to take 0.23 times that. Take my total, as my total beam mass, use your accelerometer mass and estimate your natural frequency. We'll want to see how close we get to that as well, won't we? Okay, so that's your second pre lab. We want to see how good those models are, so we're going to hopefully be able to actually measure the natural, untapped natural frequency. If, if we can measure the motion of the beam after it's been deflected and released from rest, then we could measure the period. But recognize that you can only measure the damped natural period. We know the beam is going to eventually stop oscillating, so we know there's damping there. So that period that you could measure is not the um, uh, uh, undamped natural period, it's the damped natural period, T sub D, right? So only when you have really negligible damping can you use that measured period as an estimate of the undamped natural period. So remember, since, since the damped period is related to omega n, you could estimate omega n from an estimate of this that you measure, but only if you also knew zeta, right? So you need to know zeta before you could use this relationship to estimate omega n. And so you're kind of stuck there. So it turns out, however, that there's a nice way of estimating zeta, and I'll talk about that next. So go back to your response relation, right? We looked at this before, this simple, this response equation here. Re that can be rewritten in this form. All you're doing when you do this is you're compressing everything into a cosine instead of a sine. You get an amplitude and phase. So you get a simpler relationship, relationship here with an amplitude A naught that's a function of initial conditions and the system parameters. And then you get this phi parameter, which is phase. We don't need to worry about, about that at all, actually as it turns out, and I'll show you in a second. The important thing here is that now this amplitude of this cosine, this oscillating, you know, it, it, this, this is, has a decay envelope that we can now look at, right? And that um, is a function of this A naught, which is a function of these parameters, and it's a function of zeta and omega n, okay? And so that's the key thing here. So let me show you how we use that. What you can do then is you can approximate that amplitude decay by measuring just the peak values every t sub d seconds, right? So every cycle you can measure just the peak values, okay? When you do that and you take the ratio of the peak values, so let's say you, you take the ratio between the nth cycle and the n plus 1 cycles or the next cycle, you can show that that that's just equal to the um, exponential of zeta omega n times the diff the, the period between those times. Well, that's a constant, right? That's always for this system. We're going to assume that that's always t sub d, as we show here. So this value right here is always t sub d, which is related to omega sub d, which is related to the two system parameters, right? So that ratio of peaks, which we can measure, is related to omega n and zeta directly in this exponential. So now if you take the logarithm of both sides, you get this nice little relationship, this natural log of that ratio of amplitudes is equal to this constant term, which note is only dependent on zeta, 
times the cycle number n. So the, if you take the a to the n here, and you take the next cycle, then it's only a function of the cycle number, right? This shows, again, that the log of the amplitude ratios, what we call the log decrement, is linearly related to the cycle number by a factor that's only a function of zeta. So we can find zeta just by measuring amplitudes and cycle numbers. Okay, it's a really nice result. It's called you know, log logarithmic decrement. So here's kind of what you would see. Here's I'm just showing actually two different decay envelopes. Right? So if you have an exponential decay like you'd expect from a linear system, uh, you can see that you'd have these amplitudes and you'd have an exponential decay. Um, and if you had a linear decay as another case, like we saw with the pendulum, you can now see why um, you can actually look at just the, at the decays of these types of response. And remember, these are specifically tests that you've designed in, in, in the lab to excite a system. You give it a perturbation, let it do something, and then you can extract values from it. Right? So the envelope takes on an exponential shape. And that might suggest you have linear damping. Right, so you can just by looking at it, you can say, "Hey, that look system probably has linear damping." If the decay looks linear, then it should suggest that it's not. If it's a linear decay, it's not a linear system. It's likely nonlinear because, if you recall, with a pendulum that we studied in the lab, this had coulombic type friction. So these are just some insights that you can build. But if you really want to quantify them, you have to make measurements, and and then once you do that. You, you can see this, so for the case on the left here, when I plot the log of the first amplitude divided by the successive amplitude at the following peaks, if I plot that ratio of amplitudes versus the cycle of, of uh, the cycle number, in the linear case, you'd see that you get a nice linear trend here. And this is that slope, call, calling it beta here. That's just a function of zeta. So if you can do a nice linear fit to this data, you can see you can extract zeta, right? Um, if if you plot actually that linear trend, you 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 would see that the log decrement uh, as a function of n here um, it, it does not have a linear trend, and this tells you oh this this uh, the system that that resulted in this response um, it, it, I I shouldn't model that with a linear damping model. Okay, so pre-lab 3. I'm going to give you a lab VI that runs a little simulation of a mass spring damper system. You can put in mass, you can put in damping, and you can put in um, stiffness. And what it does for you is it simulates that model. It's like you're simulating an experiment. It generates you know, time and displacement data just the way you're going to measure it. And it sends that data to some code, and I'm going to show that to you. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'd like for you to play around with that. You can show how that code basically will apply, will extract that from that data, the peaks, and then it'll send it to a little formula that gives you a zeta. Okay, this little omega here should be uh, obviously a, sim uh, a Greek omega. That's so. Use parameter. So the first one is study this code. Study the code that uh, to show how the peak detector VI built into LabVIEW can be used to find peaks of a decay in motion signal. I'm going to show you that in a second. And then use parameter values from the pre-lab question number two, um, for which you know values of omega and zeta, um, and run the VI and, and confirm that you get the value of zeta that you expect to get. Show, In other words, you're using this little simulation VI to show that if I use the same code with, exper you know, with experimentally measured data using data acquisition, you can extract um, your value of zeta. Okay, I'm going to show you that now. Okay, so here's a front panel of the VI that I'm going to post for you. This graph here shows just the response node. I've given it um, an initial condition of 1, and it just decays, right? Um, there's some red dots here where I'm actually, these, this is for a previously run case that shows the algorithm 
it detected those automatically, those peaks, okay, and their locations along the time array. And this other graph here sh plots, so you can see the log a naught over a n versus n. So this automatically gives you, this is a perfect linear model, so it gives you a nice linear uh, 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 variation between the log decrement and the cycle number. Right? Up here are your simulation parameters, which should be familiar to you by now. You may choose your, you know, I'm using RK4, initial condition, uh, position, velocity. I keep this as zero for this case. It's like the experiment. You, you're going to deflect the beam and let it go, and then it's just going to kind of decay out. And now you can play around with B, M, and K. And note this output indicator here, right? This indicator tell, tells you the zeta that was found by looking at this decay envelope. So you can you can test it. You know you should be able to calculate your zeta from here and see how well how well the algorithm works. Right? It's just kind of proving that out for you. Just look at at the code, um, because what you can do now. So focus just on this part here first. This is just the simulation, right? Using a formula node, I have the stiffness, the 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 spring force, the damping force, I'm just creating a simple little second order model x double dot here and then I'm outputting that and I'm just going to integrate that to get x dot here. I integrate that again and get x and then I send that out to a collector. Right? So you can do this a lot of different ways. You can build these, again we've talked about these before, but once you calculate x you have to bring it back in the formula node because this needs x here, right? And note it also needs xd because the damping force is b times xd is x dot, so or the velocity. Okay, so you can study this little simulation, but it's just a real simulation of simulate simple simulation of the mass spring damper. You could also take that example I have of the response and just generate the response for x because it's a formula, and you could do that as well. Okay, so that's that's generating time and signal data, right? Imagine this could be data coming from your experiment. So now this is where things hopefully uh, uh, you could I'm going to show you the pieces here and then you can apply this to your uh, own to your own VI. Just copy and paste this into your into your data acquisition VI or pull this out and, and, and put your data acquisition VI into here. That way you don't have to introduce any of this here. This is what what this does is it sends the time and the signal data and just plots it. Right? So here you're forming a multi right a multigraph of the response data, but it's also plotting the peaks. I showed you those red dots. These this second plot here is just the red dot. So that's all this code does. All of this code does doing up here on top is plotting the response data and the peaks that were found. Now how are those peaks found? Well I'm going to pull in the context help here. And it's using this little VI down here, which is built into LabVIEW. And it's called a peak detector. So how perfect is that? You send it a signal X. You can give it these other parameters, but you can see I didn't put any. All I told it was I want it to find peaks only. You can tell it, hey, I want to find peaks and valleys, or peaks or valleys, but I'm going to find just peaks. And what it does is it's note that it's, it finds the locations of the peaks and the amplitudes exactly what we want. You can also It also gives you other things, but no, that's all I'm using. So coming out of here is an array with the locations and with amplitudes. So I send the locations up here so I can plot them, and the amplitudes are sent also over here so that I can plot them. This is only discrete data. I'm going to show you something else here. That This VI, what it's doing is it's interpolating these locations. It turns out that and I, and I kind of say that here, that locations are not given in terms of index values because it might not be exactly at one of your discrete points, right? It could be between 10 and 11 and the index value, so it'll give you something like 10.5. So what this is doing is it's interpolating the locations and then finding the exact time value, okay? so. I'm not going to talk about that if you're interested in that interpolation function, how it's doing that. You're sending it the time array, you're sending it the fraction of the location delay, and then it's what it's sending out here is the exact time value where the peak occurred. 
and that's how it's able to put it right at the top of that peak. Okay, so that's what all of this is doing now. You don't need any of that to do the log decrement, but to display it, you do. So the, those locations are not needed. Note for this code down here, which is finding the log decrement and finding zeta. So, so you see, I take the amplitude data and I send it uh, to two places. One here, I have to find the cycle values, and that's what this does. Is this finds for those amplitudes how many amplitudes did I find, and it just basically it's just generating n values okay so that's all this this is counts as number of number of peaks i found so that's all this part of the code does well all this does down here is it takes those amplitudes and just computes a naught over a1 and takes the log of it right that's what that is so it's a naught the first value extracted from that array divided by all the other values and it computes the log of them and then sends it into the y value here and it plots that on the y-axis plots the cycle value on the x-axis and that's what gives you the the, L, uh, the log versus n. It also sends that as xy data into a nice little linear fit vi and what it cranks out of there is the slope right and that slope is that beta value sends that to a little inverse formula that gives you zeta right nice doesn't look simple but it is rather simple stop it and study it. I'm going to post this on the course log so um, as I said you can use it uh, when you go into lab and it's ready to go. Totally automates the process and keeps you from having to um, save the data into Excel and write your own code and so on. Um, again this is just another example of how you can use LabVIEW to process your data very quickly. So that's what this pre-lab is about. Um, I want you to run the case for your using the numbers from your pre-lab case number two and um, show that hey I know what the zeta value is when I ran this I got that zeta value back print a screenshot submit that with your, with your pre-lab so what are the lab objectives I want you to go in there and have a reasonable value of the beam stiffness added mass and the beam mass right so I'm gonna basically how much of that beam mass do you want to add you're gonna be introduced to an accelerometer in the lab on how to use it, um, and I want you to, um, you know, create that beam mass system. You may ask. You know, sometimes we the TAs will add a little bit more mass than just the accelerometer. It's only 46 grams, um, and then um, you're going to experimentally determine the damp natural period and the system damping ratio using the methods that we just talked about. I want you to use your measured damping ratio to, to um, finalize estimates for your undamped natural frequency. Remember, you can't get the undamped natural frequency until you find your damping ratio. Once you have that, then you can also find the total effective mass of your system, which lets you find what fraction. Once you have the undamped natural frequency, right, that's when you can uh, subtract the lump mass and you can find, hey, how much of that beam mass did I have to put in there? And that's when then you can go and compare, first, see if it's within the limits. Second, how well does then Hartog's formula work? You know, how um, how good was that theoretical estimate? Okay. Um, and that's actually this last point here. I want you to, one of the pre labs I also want you to have is think about those experiments, think about everything that I've talked about, and have some lab procedures sketched out for finding your zeta using like log decrement. Think about all the steps that you're going to have to go through to find these things. Um, the TA is going to look over your procedures, give you some guidance. Basically, have a um, kind of a little step procedure of your own that, that will help you get through this lab. And I think I've talked enough about what we need to do so that you can at least sketch something out there. And the TA is not going to, you know, completely abandon you, but he's going to try to see how you, how you do in, in stepping your way through these experiments. Before I talk about the lab evaluation, just summarizing, again, as I said, these mass spring damper models help you understand a wide range of practical problems. Also, the design of motion sensors. And um, you don't need to know how the accelerometer works, per se, but I'll show you in a second a couple of things I want you to at least look at the accelerometer specifications. You know, if you were going to choose an accelerometer, you have to know something about that. Um, you can understand the underlying design of 
many types of sensors such as accelerometers, but understanding the signal is just um, we'll, we'll use that accelerometer to measure acceleration. Sometimes you can get away with not using acceleration. Maybe we might just use a uh, laser displacement sensor to measure the, uh, the motion. Uh, but we often use accelerometer um, in, that, in this case. Again, a, a separate lecture will we'll, uh, talk about that. And so I have as a pre-lab five is for you to actually look at the general specifications for that accelerometer, and I'll I'll do that in a separate and hopefully short via uh, video on accelerometer basics for your interest. But we'll look at the specifications for the uh, accelerometer that we're using, and I'll talk a little bit about about uh, their working principles, and we'll look at the spec page, and and it'll help you with this uh, with. Uh, understanding these specifications. So here's your lab evaluation. Okay, I'm going to ask the TA uh, to evaluate your work this way. I can, you should, when you walk out of lab, be able to explain why it's never really possible to directly measure undamped natural period, uh, frequency. That's, or period. It, that's um, something that I'd expect for you to orally be able to communicate to the TA or to me. Um, you should report on the values determined for the system damping ratio the un and both the damped and undamped natural frequencies and also for the total effective mass and the fractional beam mass for those models. Um, these last two questions um, the TA may choose one or both to give you but I'd like for you to capture the acceleration of, your, of the tip of the beam using the accelerometer and or a displacement sensor. You might measure both if you have a chance. Um, and uh, let's say you give it a known initial condition. You have these critical parameters. I want to see how well you can predict the response. You know, And so figure out a way to compare your response model to calculations of peak values to those that you measure. Right? How well does your model, what does that response formula predict you know, acceleration or displacement, right? Um, the nice thing if you measure in displacement is you could compare that directly with the measurement of displacement. Otherwise, you're going to have to differentiate that this displacement formula to get your acceleration values, aren't you? Okay, keep that in mind. Another one um, is, and this one might be a little easier, given these values, maybe the TA will come in and see, hey, how well did, did you does your instrument work? Your instrument being your your processes, and he might add, and sometimes can use a piece of clay, and he'll add a known lumped mass to your system, and then ask you to repeat and see if you can find and determine what that mass is uh, dynamically, right? Without any other measurement, he'll get you'll he'll attach the mass, you'll run your data instrument, and you'll tell him, oh, that weighed so many grams, okay? So that might be another way that the TA will evaluate how, how well you were able to complete all of your experimental work. All right, thank you.